Yes, welcome to the show. Definitely, I, I am so excited. Uh, you work for one of the my favorite brands in the world. Wow. Uh, can you do introduction for us, please, sir? So I'm Mike Hamrick. Uh, I work over here at Willwood Engineering, or what we call Willwood Disc Breaks. Um, I manage our events and promotions. Um, so I handle all of our trade show stuff, doing stuff with you like this today, Joe, um, promoting the company. I've been here for 18 years. Wow. Okay. My, my boss started here when he was 18, and he's been here 31 years. What? That is insane. Yeah, and the company was only founded in 77. So we, we, we've, we've got 43 years, right? 43 years under our belts. How, how did, where did World would come from? Let's, let's start in the beginning. Where did the whole, the, this whole system or this whole breaking system come from, from your side? So Bill Wood, the owner, William Wood, you see the correlation, Will Wood, William Wood. Yeah. He's the owner and founder. He's here every day. Um, he was working in the aerospace industry here in Southern California and was also into cars. And he was seeing a lot of racing evolve, especially through the 60s, late 60s, 70s. Mm. I mean, here in the States, you look at NASCAR, there was a lot of evolution of those cars at that point. So... He started following a lot of what he was doing for a living, which was aerospace and doing brakes for airplanes and started taking a lot of that development and idea and translating it over into racing. So I would say early 70s, he was at a lot of races, learning as much as he could. And then through the mid 70s, he started to realize that he could turn that into his own business. And now it's one of the most recognized brake brands in the world. And I love hearing I that mean, though, because you're on the other side of the world. And, and I love to uh, hear that. Hands down, probably, I mean, I, I, I call Wal Woolwoods to me is a, it's a, when when guys sit in the, you know, you, you always have your sleepers, you know, sleeper cars, race cars and stuff. That's how you, a proper race guy, that's how you always know you've got a proper race guy with a sleeper. Is you don't try and look and see what's under the hood. You got to see what's on the wheel, what's behind the wheels. And normally it's a set of Woolwoods sitting there. And when the guy's got Woolwoods on his car, that means he's, he's, he needs serious braking that goes with whatever serious power. That means you, you take a th and second think of <laughs> if you're going to race him. Yeah, see, that, that was always the tattletale side. The iconic large red caliper that sits there. <laughs> um, that, that, was, that was always the, the giveaway. Um, you, so Woolwood grew up basically with the riding industry in the U.S., I mean, it's it's a product that that was growing like the Edelbrox and and that type of stuff. Am I right? I feel that 18 years ago when I started here, I knew the brand already. I had used the brand, and I had used it in places that weren't accustomed, like it is today, 18 years later, that Willwood's so known for, which is a lot of the streetcar market. So mm -hmm. when I first started, um. I was sat in a chair and I was told to take care of the hot rods. So that was my job. That's so, a very big term, hot rod. I mean, well, okay. that was, that's what it was, was the hot rod market. It wasn't the street market. It wasn't the muscle car market. It was the hot rod market. And I would say after about five years, we realized, no, that's a street car market. You know, there's, there's something to be had for the streetcar market. And I really feel that that's when the evolution started 15 years ago about where we started doing a lot more street car stuff. But here's something that I find every day that I'm learning with being here at Willwood. 90% of what we do for the streetcar market was evolved from what we've learned in racing. Oh, that's awesome. 
That's so, awesome. But the, the, people always say that that is the best way for any any brand. I mean, that, that's why you've got companies throwing what hundreds of millions behind Formula One and all this type of stuff because it's a controlled environment where you can test your product to the absolute limit. You can find out where breaking points, heating points are and everything because there's no I mean, that, that, that car just takes so, especially on the braking, it just takes so much punishing during, during that time, those, that hour or two hours that you're on the track. Yeah. And, and the one thing that I always like to let customers know is there's three main ingredients to making a brake system work really well. And that's the suspension, the brakes, and what I feel is really number one is the tire. So you've got these tire companies that are in different forms of racing and they're using that data and technology, even from say motocross. I know of one tire company that takes a lot of what they've learned from motocross, from supercross in the United States, and it even translates down into their road car brands that they sell tires. Really? For. Yeah. So there's a lot of development in all forms of motorsport. Um, mm. A lot of the the formula drift, you follow yes. like formula drift? Oh, so we, yeah, yeah, big into drifting. So we we deal with so many of those teams in formula drift here in the United States and worldwide. But here in the States, we deal with so many of those teams and racers that the tire companies, Willwood, um, suspension companies, we're learning so much because it's evolving so much all the time. Mm. So we, we're all learning from it. And if you can get those three elements to work well, you can get a car to handle well. But going back to when you say, if, when you're talking about, you know, especially the 70s, 80s, you, I mean, look, like I said, I'm, I'm on completely other side of the water um, when it came to this. But it was always like you, you had the street rods and then you had the drag guys, you know. It was, you either had a dragster or you had a street rod. Mm -hmm. And it was only towards the mid-90s when the pro mod era started coming coming in where guys were i mean like obviously you you had hot or street rods and hot rods that had big motors and stuff but the cars weren't based on performance it was just big shiny motor and you know it was just all oh, shined how did they yeah it was go, going fast it was it's only like towards end of what like the end of the 90s early 2000s that it all came down to now. Now it's about performance. It's about cornering. It's about building a hot rod or building cars now that that can compete with the European the European racing type cars um, and and the race track. I mean, and that's I think that's where your 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 products really started kicking up more more than anything else because all of a sudden I mean we all in any car guy the the thing you learn is as soon as you up horsepower you you up brakes that's you know uh, the, there should be a, a graph where brakes need to go first actually <laughs> and see that, that's my job is that's what we're doing when we're at events and at and at trade shows is explaining look you're going to make it go fast you got to make it stop fast you got to make it stop good yeah. you know and and exactly. i think that i think that with the evolution of the internet, which really took place about the same time you're talking, it's mm -hmm. opened people's eyes up so they have a lot more information right in front of them. So they're able to really also do some comparisons. You know, hey, mm. should, should I buy the suspension or should I do the brakes? And what brakes should I buy? Exactly. So I want to say that a lot of, of what we're doing here at Willwood is um, educating before we make somebody spend their dollars or whatever you guys <laughs> use there in South Rands. <laughs> we have rents. <laughs> so making sure that you're you're spending your money wisely on the on the mm. right pieces first. So um, I think that's at, that that's what's really helped Willwood is. We're going to tell you, hey, you should really change the rear end in your in your muscle car to a full floater if you're going to go out on the track. 
And it's because of these reasons. You know, we'll, yeah. we'll tell them where to spend their money first so that when they do get to the breaks, it's the best experience possible. But look, in, in, in the muscle car market, I mean, if you're talking from 65 to like 72, I mean, the brakes were horrible on all the muscle cars, you know? I mean, they, they were big blocks. They were everything there. But, I mean, you could do a quarter mile in, in, what's it, 14 seconds with a car off the line, but you needed five miles to stop after that quarter mile. <laughs> It reminds me of my childhood. <laughs> I know. So, I mean, and you guys started with the bolt-on kits, which I think started revolutionizing everything. As soon as you guys you guys started with the kits where it went, okay, listen, it's not just about individual parts. You got, you got a 67 Mustang bolt-on kit, bolt-on, bolt-off. There's no modification. There's nothing going. It's, you know, it's... A, Saturday afternoon and you and you're rolling again. I mean, that to me that when when I was I, mean, I remember in Hot Rod when I started reading up in the parts and stuff you guys would bring, that blew my mind. I mean, I was and I was like in my but early teens at at that stage. That to me was just that made so much sense of getting getting that message across and stuff because it was daunting. I think at that stage was what before you guys came along. What do you do with brakes? Where do you go? What engineering? What do you, do you need to just try and take something from another car? Um, it was revolutionary, absolutely. Yeah, and and I think that we've gotten as a company to the point that uh, we've done so many different vehicles for so many different uses that now we've got these theoretical setups that are going to work right for what you're doing. So mm. if you're building a 69 Camaro and it's going to have 15 inch wheels and you want it to look stock, but it had drum brakes on it, we can get you into a nice factory looking brake so that the car still looks like a sleeper. Yeah. Not nice and easy, but if you want to go all the way to like what we have behind me, which is our in-house Mustang, a 66 Mustang, I can see that's been pulling my eyes over to that side the whole time. <laughs> so that car is a full chassis, uh, late model engine, uh, six speed transmission, full floating rear end. And it's got pretty much the biggest, baddest brakes that we offer for, say, that pro touring marketplace. And that car, I mean, I can drive it 500 miles today with the air conditioning on. It's that nice of a driver. Very nice. So nice. we're able to really ask the customer what they're doing with their car, you know, especially in like street rods. Um, it's funny that there's a lot of shows I go to and the guys are building these rat rods, right? You guys. Yeah. Got there, right. Yeah. We got some. Yeah. I actually had some of them with some of the, your rat rod guys on the show. Um, oh. Last night, I know, I know this is off, off the topic. Last night I was talking to a guy. Uh, you would have seen him. I think at Cena. At SEMA, uh, Alexander, he's the guy that did the Lambo rat rod. Mm. I don't know if you saw that. I have seen that. I'm busy. I, I, I was busy. To, uh, unfortunately, he's French, so we can't get him on the show. <laughs> so we, because uh, the communication is a bit rough. Um, but I was talking to him last night because uh, we're doing an article on him for the for the magazine. But yes, sorry, continue. Well, I, I'll come across customers that say. I want to build a car that looks like that. So I want it to look rat rod ish, but I want to drive it. And mm. there's one customer that goes to hot August nights. Have you ever heard of a hot, hot August nights? Yes. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a real hoot. That's something that if you come All to right. the States for, you'd really enjoy yourself. Um, mm. He showed up last year with the rattiest rat rod, but it was self-induced. So everything had a purpose. Everything yeah. worked. It looked ratty, but it was actually a piece of billet that he distressed to make it look like what? it was ratty. That's cool. And I helped him with the brakes on this thing. And he goes, I, I didn't think I'd enjoy driving this thing. And I'm only four inches off the ground, but I love driving this car. I can go 70 on the freeway. No problem. Gee. 
so so it's nice because we can really help you engineer something that's going to work for what you're going to do with the vehicle. And, and that's, mm. taken, that's taken a while for us to get to. And again, I, I have to, I have to strongly let everybody know that it's because of our racing background and how much racing we do. Um, lots of circle track, dirt circle track, asphalt circle track. I, I handle a lot of our off-road market. So a lot of the off-road racing here in the States yes. and worldwide. We, we have customers that are building vehicles for Dakar out of France, and they only use Willwood. Yes. Look, uh, I mean, uh, we, we've got a lot of drag guys and stuff in South Africa that only uses Willwood as well. Um, drag guys, I've got, I know a lot of track guys, um, everybody, like I said, they swear by your products, um, yeah. definitely. So, I mean, your, your product was mainly US-based. Have you guys started expanding into, like, the European market now that – now that the what you you've got old European cars that's now becoming cool, not like the Jap market, uh, the Japanese or Jap market that's so wrong, the Japanese market, um, but you've got like the the BMWs and and these type of thing that's like especially the the E30s and that type of stuff. Have you guys started developing more products in, on that side of the market, on that side of it, uh, the market as well? You know we have, and and a lot of where we've designed it is based around demand and what you're going to find in the United States. But what I can tell you is we have a lot of customers that purchase large amounts of Willwood product and they're building brake kits based off of a lot of our input for engineering for different parts of the world. So for instance, um, if you called me and said that I want a brake kit for a Holden Commodore. Yes. Yeah. Because people go on the internet or the interweb, like I like to call it. <laughs> and they'll see Willwood brakes on that car. Well, we've never had one of those cars here. So mm. we'll just ask them, where are you out of? Well, I'm out of Australia. Well, you need to go to Waddington Street Rods. They're the ones who are building the brake kit for that car. What's crazy is here in the United States, a big Japanese market is the older Supras. Yes. Third, huge here yeah, as well. Third and fourth gen. Well, if you see Willwood brakes on them, Willwood didn't make that brake kit. They came from a handful. Crazy. Of, yeah, they came from a handful of customers here in the states and maybe worldwide. But here in the states, we have three customers that do nothing but buy our product and build brake kits for niche markets. So that that helps us out because if that's their niche market. We don't want to start building those super kits. We want them to keep doing it because they have mm. the to get it across the United States and worldwide. Um, well, it makes sense. They're doing the, all the R and D. I mean, you guys are supplying. They they they're looking at what size, whether they want a ten inch or fifteen inch, uh, you know, four part five or six part or what, whatever pods and yep. stuff. So you guys are supplying a set product, and, and they're doing they're doing the own R and D. Yes, and we're that helping works. with input with what piston sizes, what rotor widths, but they've got the channel for getting that product out. So um, another real big marketplace here in the United States that, that happens is like early Japanese cars, 240Zs. Yeah. We don't make a 240Z brake kit or a 260 or a 280 or a 280ZX or a 300. Mm -hmm. We have customers that do. So I mean, to me, that makes sense. You, you know, I think that there's just two, there's, there's too many cars, <laughs> if I want to put it that way. I mean, for a comfort guys to expect someone like you to to sort of make a break, especially the kit upgrade kits and stuff for everything that's out there. I mean, I've seen what is this? Um, 80 Toyota Corollas, um, which we had here, running massive Willwoods. Sure. Um, will we break some stuff as well? You guys have created a product that is so good that the amount of fabrication that the guys are doing it to, to try and run that makes sense. But the fact that you've got a product that is so versatile, if that makes sense. It absolutely yeah. does. So here's something that I, I educate not just our customers about, but I educate our sales staff about all the time. So we, we have what's called a profit center here at Willwood. So a profit center would be 
uh, circle track asphalt racing so that we can monitor what we're selling to that market, correct? So we have it for street rods. We have it for drag racing. We have it for off-road. Well, one of the things that is crazy to me is we have large handfuls of product that are sold in over tw- the same part number, sold in 24 to 27 profit centers. Wow. So like the Dynalite Caliper. You've, you know the Dynalite yeah. I mean, that's, that's the Willwood staple. That's the, the cornflakes mm. of Willwood, right? We have a, a couple part numbers that are so widely distributed that it's the same part for that Corolla that is, as it is on the back of a Camaro brake kit, as it is on the front of a little Honda. What? Same part number. Oh, but that's just clever business because I mean that means that you guys have one patent, one one set design, and it's one upgrade that you guys are doing, and it's what 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 how do they call it? one throat to choke scenario, you know? There you go. Um, and that comes that that comes down to a lot about what Willwood is based around. Um, we're based around uh, engineering first, so making sure that when a product's designed. Um, the tooling is made, the forgings are made and designed. It's all done here at Willwood. We don't send anything out. It's all done here. And the same engineer will take it all the way through the steps to the final part number. So oh, wow. there's some intimacy with that. What's good about it is we know what machines are going to run what parts and the most effectively and efficiently so that we can have the most effective and efficiently sold product. So Mm -hmm. you've probably also heard people say, gosh, you know, Willwood Caliper is only $135 US. Well, they don't realize that one machine today in eight hours made 250 of them. What? And that's what, see? (laughs) That's one thing that people maybe don't. one day you need to take us through your machining area to, to show us how what that no no I've, I've got a better idea I think I need to come there and come and do it and come do a tour so. <laughs> you're more than welcome anytime um well right now is a little bit difficult but we we would no. we would make it we would make it happen for sure yeah we if you're ever in Southern California I uh, well um I, I saw last night um it was last night, the night before, uh, wedding came through SEMA as a go. Everything is forward, moving forward for SEMA. Um, I, I'm just hoping I can get out the country and get into your country in order to to get there for it. So I'm hoping to get to get myself there. Uh, we actually had Wade uh, Kawasaki and them from Coker and everybody on the show a while back. Oh, um, are you guys Have you guys got anything set up for, for SEMA this year? Oh, absolutely. Um, we are fortunate enough to get a little more square footage. So we're going from 1200 square feet to 1800 square feet. And no, our, our plans are a hundred percent. So we, we, we honestly were waiting to, to finally hear that the show was going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, our, our, <laughs> the area that you see out here is where I set up the booth and it takes up the whole entire square footage um and i'm a little behind because i was kind of waiting until last week to find out but you know uh so you guys you guys have to get building very quickly yeah i'm I'm gonna have to start working on that and we haven't been doing as many shows here here in the states we've we've been fortunate that a lot of events at racetracks are happening but larger social gatherings aren't um, so hearing about SEMA was a good thing. So, um, the racing that's happening on this side at the moment. So it's, it's like I, I saw NASCAR and then we're running races, but there's just no spectators basically. So the races are, are themselves are continuing, but there's just no spectators at the moment. And are you guys, can you guys at least still get in to do your testing and stuff at the same time? So not this coming weekend, but the following weekend, uh, we sponsor an autocross. Autocross has become yes. a, a, a big, a, 
a big form of getting to the track and having a driving experience. And what I love about autocross is I really understand, I, I learn a lot of car control from it. So mm. we sponsor an event that a lot of the participants have our products on their cars. So I love those weekends because I'm dealing with those racers or drivers mm -hmm. and trying to get their cars to work better so that we've got we've got more underneath our our hat and we're learning from it is, is that those events like the optima um they have it just off the SEMA. um yeah is it events events like that we, we actually had it at one of those uh events or well we covered it in the last magazine um because i was talking to the guys from optima they were telling us more about it i think that that is such an awesome form of racing though i mean yeah. it's it's not just the, the good old top end runs and drag runs which is the, the only opportunity guys get i mean that that really gets you your your, your Okay. It tests your engineering more than anything else. So you're building the builder of your car because it's not straight line. It's not just all about power. It's about how you handle that power. Uh, those are great events. So it's funny you bring up the Optima series because we were sponsors of that series for the Speed Stop for five years. Yeah. So we sponsored. Really? The, yeah, we sponsored the Speed Stop section of it. When it first went on TV, mm -hmm. we were the sponsor. Um, in 2015, I got the chance to drive that Mustang at six events for one year. Oh, nice. And I, although, I, although I didn't win any I was, events. <laughs> yeah. I didn't win any events, but I finished 14th throughout the whole country. And I made my way into OUSCI, which is the big uh, race after SEMA. Because I was talking to Cam Douglas yeah. from Optima. He, he was telling me all about all about the event and, and uh, everything. He, I need to make contact with him because we, we haven't seen that event in South Africa. They haven't showed it or it, it, it's, it has been broadcasted on, on this side. Um, I know because it was running through certain channels and stuff in the U.S. And uh, Cam actually said, I, they're more than happy to give us a few seasons so I can run it from, from this side. Because I I, when I saw them, because I, 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 obviously I saw some trailers and stuff around it. It just, like, I, I, I love that form of racing. It's just, it's a different form of, it's a different style to, to come through, you know? And it's a great product for man on the street. It's not a full checkbook run. Um, literally, you, you can have a guy in a 65 or a, a, a Mustang go compete against a guy with a Ferrari, and you can be running the same times. Well, the, you know? the, current um, champion, the current champion, you want to look this up, his name is Mike Dussol. I'll yes. send information on him. He's two-time champion, two times in a row. Yeah. It's a first-generation Camaro. No way. Oh, wait, okay. yes. I, I saw that. I well, saw that. All, um, that's all we would equip from, from brake pedals, nice. masters, calipers, rotors, everything. And that's a car that I... I've worked for the last four or five years with just to get that car to where it is now. But that must be great working with a product where, I mean, you guys come in and you, you get in and you guys put down your product and you, you, everything in, and you can physically see in a result, you yeah. know, it's, and, it's, and I've learned a, you know, a lot. Um, you know, you, Here's another thing about any form of racing, but especially the Optima series is you're trying to set up a car to do four or five different things really well. So road mm. course, autocross, those aren't the same, by the way. You set the cars up way better. Then speed stop, which honestly is kind of a mixture between the autocross and the road racing. And then design and engineering. I mean, the car has got to be on point. It has to look nice. And then you also have to drive it on the street. So it's got to exactly. have turn signals, registration, stop. 
It's got to have a horn even, they check for that. A stereo, they check for that. Really? Yeah. So so you cannot do a purposely built car. I mean, this this yeah. has to be... Uh, it has, no, you cannot do a cool. purpose built car. So the last two seasons, Mike DeSole has won the championship overall. Um, there was another gentleman in between there that won, not on Willwood, but a good friend of ours. And then the car that had won the years before that was an Evo 8 Mitsubishi. What? What? Right? So, an Evo the, isn't the Evo four wheel? Oh, wait, no, but that's also rear wheel drive. That's not four wheel drive, hey? All wheel drive. So it runs in its All own. All wheel way. drive. Correct. So you. Okay, so it's a class. Uh, they, they then must have changed the classes. Because, I mean, if you're telling me that you got a rear wheel, real Camaro that was competing against the all wheel, I mean, that's that's <laughs> that's a hard one. I'm telling you, that's what's so cool about that series. Oh, that's very. I'll, I'll get hold of Cam again. Maybe we should get some of the drivers and stuff onto the show. Um, so we can find out. I said to Cam, maybe we need to just try and do one in South Africa. Um, I know that they, they did one in Australia, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they, um, they, they did take the opportunity they had one Australia. in Australia. Yeah. You know what? I'd love to do one in South Africa. What would work out really well for you, I think, is if you had some of the sponsors that sponsor the the events. So like Detroit Speed. Yes. You can have Kyle talk to someone, someone of his stature, yeah. someone who works for him talk to you. Um, Falcon Tires. Do you guys have Falcon Tires and we stuff? We have. Like yes, we have Falcon Tires. It's very big in the drifting on the drifting scene and stuff oh. in in South Africa as well. Um, it's it's amazing. <laughs> you know, I've had the the Hot Rod Magazine for about thirteen. It's going on 14 years now, and we're still going. We we, uh, we 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 couldn't print for a few months now, but I'm I'm busy wrapping up this week. Funny enough, I'm going to print uh, the end of this week uh, my first mag or first magazine since COVID. And I've always wanted. I I used to do events um, in one of in Cape Town, by us, but I always wanted to expand it and and. Talk to guys like you and start doing more of a trade show. We, we get someone like you to, to come to South Africa and actually come educate the market more than anything else. I, I, you know, it's, it's always so hard to get, you know, I get, to, look, I, I'm lucky. I get to talk to guys like you and I get to learn a lot, but it's very hard to pass that on constantly. Um, we, we've done it now. Uh, I know Rockford Fastgate has started doing that in South Africa where every now and then they bring some guys in. But maybe we need to start working with you guys and get some road shows going or something. Get someone like you to come to South Africa and, you know, we go visit a few shops and go visit, set up a, a show or two. And um, we, we get to actually educate the market on... It's, it's not about just pushing a brand. It's about safety more than anything. That That is the big thing. And uh, I think that's the part the that guys is, don't understand. The education is number one. Um, mm. If you if you're talking with and working with brands that want to give you an education, and then tell or sell you on, hey, these are the best parts for your use. Those are the type of brands that I feel are are doing well, especially right now, um, because at the end of the day. There, there's been numerous times where people have said, well, I, I just want to take this other brand off my car and put yours on it because it'll work better. And I say, that's that's not the right way to that's go about this. That's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. Let, there's got to be something else underlying that's not working right because I know that that other product should be working fine. So by taking a couple few extra steps, getting some pictures, um, having them shoot a video of what I'm asking for, I'll say, hey, I, as much as I want you to, to buy some Willwood products, the Willwood product isn't going to work well either unless you fix, <laughs> and if you can believe this, dash four steel rated line throughout your whole entire race car. You need to switch that all over to 3 16 hard line. You need, to, <laughs> you need to bleed the brakes better. You need to understand how the balance bar works. 
And then they do all these things and go, gosh, you know what? You helped me so much, but the car's stopping so good now, but I still want to run your product because you helped us. And, and exactly. that's, what it's about. that's what it's about. Um, exactly. So exactly. That's, I, I feel, um, a, lot of, that's I feel what, a lot of companies have gotten to that point. Well, look, now especially, I think it's going to, guys are going to be turning pennies, you know, um, especially coming out of COVID. It's, it's not just going to be a free for all. Guys are really going to start looking at one, which product they're buying, is the support there, is the backup there, is the company going to be there in 10, <laughs> in five years, which means if I'm going to buy this, I'm going to go do. So I, I do think a lot of new brands or brands that guys don't know are going to suffer uh, at the moment. But because it is going, I think brand loyalty is going to become a much bigger thing at the moment. And having a support infrastructure, because you know, for, for someone like me sitting in South Africa, it, it's it's a big thing because okay, we, we don't have access to i mean look at this youtube and all this type of stuff but we don't have access directly to to guys like like yourself you know um so if we can try and get get a wording in so we can educate and we can we can inform um because like like you just said it, it makes sense there's a lot that's it's not just about bolting a product on i mean i found that with brakes you know you can't just stick a, a bigger caliper on and you know and everything's going to be better you know, there, there's so many other elements that you need to look at that still goes into it. And I think there's a lot we can still learn um, more than anything. How's development? Sorry, I, I know that it's, it's, we're almost running out of time. How is development? What, where's breaking still going? What, what's coming up now? Especially with now, um, we, we've been having a lot of conversation about electric cars and all this type of stuff with the EV market that's growing worldwide. Um, where's com a company like Woolwood going and moving forward? One thing that I I find with us, which is different than you brought up earlier, you know, you've got your 60s and 70s muscle cars, and they went really fast in a straight line, but they didn't turn, they didn't stop very well, sometimes not that comfortable. Um now you look at those same muscle cars, late model muscle cars, and they'll pretty much drive themselves. Meaning, yes. you point it in a direction and it'll go straight. You don't know. You almost don't have to hold onto the wheel. But but growing up, my grandpa's '69 El Camino with a 396 and a four-speed. Yeah, I I was death gripping that thing, right? And it didn't stop them. Mm. So. Now you've got cars that go in a straight line, they stop in a straight line. It's because of all this technology, right? So one thing yeah. that one thing we find ourselves constantly watching is where braking is going. And for instance, late model vehicles, it's much harder to design a brake system that's gonna work better or more efficiently than a factory brake setup. And yes. it's all the technology, it's all right there at, at the guy who designed the car. It's right there at his fingertips now, right? Hmm. So when we're looking at especially late model vehicles and coming up with a, a brake system for them, we're looking at a lot more of the dynamics of how can we give you the same amount of performance but lighter? How can we cool the system off quicker? How can we hmm. make it so that that three quarter or one ton truck that we put brakes on, how can we help him get brakes back after going down a big hill with his trailer? How, how can we yes. make this more efficient and give the customer reasons why it's a better product? So the same thinking that we're constantly putting into these late model cars, once we sort it out, we're, we're, it's trickling down into all of the earlier cars. For instance, like that Mustang. The Mustang has yeah. been doing a lot of testing for, we've had the same hat and rotors on that car for about a year and a half, but it's the same technology that we're putting into our late model brake systems right now. Um, 
also dabbling a lot in ABS brake systems for early cars. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, that, oh, so you'd be able to buy a brake upgrade system, uh, ABS brake upgrade system for. And, that's going to be cool. And we're there's a lot of fingers in that stream, so it, it's <laughs> yeah. a lot, like a lot. Here's an example of a product where, in the last year, we came out with, we introduced it at SEMA, and you'll notice that a lot of cars are now you push a button. And it's an electronic caliper that clamps down on the rotor for your parking brake. Yes. So a lot that, of that of, started that freaked me out. Yeah. So that a lot freaked of me out. I mean, I, they're like that now. No. no. That, we look, have the first time. I, you, so you guys have now developed. So it's like basically electric brake, like uh, the Audis and and those uh, those guys came out with. Am I right? Yeah, so we have a caliper that has an electric motor on the backside that literally oh, wow. pushes the piston down on the caliper to hold the rotor in place for a parking brake. And we so, the whole wiring harness and everything. So does that run separate from your other calipers on yes. the car? Or is that – okay. Because I, I, uh, I had a guy um, – I used to own a shop where I, I, I built cars, and I had a guy come in with a – he had a 57 Chevy, uh, which was running on an El Camino chassis, okay. 57 truck. Um, and they did the same – they did something similar to it. So – and they just put a switch on so it would lock the back – the rear brakes. But they used the actual brakes on the yeah. car. Now that, and that's – I'm like, but – yeah, that's Your another e brake is supposed to be failure. Uh, e brake is, I mean, that's for failure as well. I mean, that's why the e brake, well, if I understand correctly, e brake behind it was, if your main brakes failed, you still had your e brake. You know, you could you could still stop the car. And the fact that now you're using all your brakes is just sitting. You know, yes, you you're relying on one thing. <laughs> when it comes to braking, that's never a good idea. No, yeah. see, Especially if the, car the, still, the yeah. true parking brake system. You always want to have a separate circuit than the braking. So guys exactly. that have drift handles that put a little lock that mechanically hold it. Yeah. Uh, that's not yeah. still in the braking system, right? When you have an internal drum, that's good because that's a separate mechanical system than the hydraulics of the braking. Let me grab this caliper really quick and I'll show it to you. Oh, yes. It'll blow you away. If you don't mind. So this is the caliper that I've got it set up for a display right now. So it has a, a sticker on it, and it's got something to re represent the rotor. Yeah. But we feed power to it. There's an electric motor that pushes the piston against the rotor yeah. and holds the caliper in place. Or holds the... That is so cool. That is so cool. I'll send you some information on that. Yes, please. Please do. I'll, I'll put it into I'll, – I'll, I'd love to run that in the next magazine. Um, get I'll some more information. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's where we're constantly trying to evolve is if we're going to – and it's only because it's a, a big platform that's sold here, which is the Honda Civic. Yes, Honda we have it here as well, yeah. Yeah, they're all electric parking brake. Well, we weren't able to do a rear brake kit. Because we didn't have any way of doing a parking brake. That but now makes we do. So much, that makes so much sense. That is such a cool way of, of solving a problem. Going, okay, well, you know, we, we can't we can't supply to this type of market until we get there. I'm impressed, my friend. I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense because you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You're just making the wheel better. You're making it safer uh, more than anything else. Um, look, I, I know there's now what's it, ceramic discs coming in and all the all this type of weird stuff. Weird. I mean, uh, there, but is there development and different must be different materials and stuff that's going in? What, like you said, what cools better? Fluids, uh, fluids type of structure, well, we, um, different bolts. They do carbon ceramic brakes too. Yes, I, I know you guys use them in some of the some of the race cars and stuff. I've actually seen them. I mean, look, it's 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 phenomenal where 
just in the last like ten years, what, what from a breaking perspective of of where where it's gone, um, and to think about it, that's one just one small aspect of what sits on the car, um, and the fact that in in a few years that like that sixty five Mustang is going to probably be driving, it, you can make it drive exactly the same as a twenty twenty Mustang that you're buying off the you know they're buying now just from aftermarket parts like you're like yourself you know yep. um that's absolutely awesome so I, I i don't want to keep you all day but this was seriously cool i i hope we can do it again and now are you oh yeah now are you racing the, the optima challenge again are you still racing so i i haven't competed in that series since i did an event in 2017 uh, yeah. in that car but what i really enjoyed about that series now is going to the events and working with the customers that are running our product that's cool i'm learning from it but then i'm also typically educating some new customers about what we've got going on and mm. and that is that is a a big part of what we're about is um, it is a good thing when we show up to an event and we're a part of the event. That I was just thinking that that is such a good way of represent representing. I mean, that means you guys are there to see physically see how your your products are performing. You're yep. not a well. Someone's bought it and it's. You know, it's gone out into the big world and my parts are out there and, you know, you guys are at the event and you're actually talking to the guys and, and moving with it. Because, I mean, you have no idea what, especially with an event like that, it's so hard on breaking and stuff the whole time. Um, that's actually, that's actually brilliant. I, I wish actually more companies did that. I mean, you, you see a lot of companies sitting at a race event, but that's more just to drink champagne with VIPs and, you know. Maybe in South Africa. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, clearly. I'm going to the wrong events. Okay. <laughs> well, for instance, you know, we, we sponsor an autocross here in Southern California, and it's become, a, it's become an autocross that every month everybody wants to go to. And it's not just because – it's at a good facility, which is California Speedway. Um, nice. It's not because some really good people show up. It's because everybody goes and has a good time. And by Sunday at the award ceremony, they felt like they learned something. They learned how to drive yeah. better. They learned how to set up their car better. Um, the tire companies are typically walking around and they're even driving at the event. So they're giving you feedback about a new tire, um, what tire that's pressure you awesome. should run. So that's really where I, I feel this is evolving. Um, a lot of well, the, days of, the days of the static shows are, that, that was, look, I, I grew up with, with motor shows and they just, motor shows just became boring as hell. Cause I mean, look, you got a lot of cars to, to, to look at, you know, and you see friends and you get to talk, you know, talk to them and this type of stuff. But just from an event, it just, I love how interactive everything's become, you yes. know. It's it's not just park there, talk there, and then, you know, end of the afternoon you, you're going home. Yeah, drink beer, get into a fist fight, you know, the normal stuff. <laughs> But th that's that's brilliant. Uh, have you guys? I, I, I've started seeing it a lot coming through uh, from the US, off-road events, but like speed off-road events. Have you started seeing them? More jumps, jumping, uh, and this type of stuff. It's like the Baja type of event, not as big, but more guys are they starting to do that? Because I mean, you, you still have your plain off-roading, you know, trying climb a mountain in a four by four or go, go up a hill or, or something like that. But these are like more speedy 
speed events coming up. I mean, that that is really exciting. So um, are, you, are I, you talking about like you know who Robbie Gordon is? Why does Robbie Gordon sound sound familiar? Um, what's that event? Man, Cam was telling he was there at uh, I think it was the end of last year. It's in the middle of desert. King of the uh, I mean, oh, what a brilliant event! I get what, I, I know Aaron, Aaron Kaufman did it now as well. His show was just on 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 TV in South Africa. Yeah. So oh. so I I work with teams that have won almost half of the King of the Hammers. So the the car that Cam Douglas sponsors, his name yeah. is Eric Miller. Yes. So Eric Miller is a solid axle racer. Um, one of his cars won this past year with Will Woods on it. He finished third. We thought it was second. Damn it, it was third. So <laughs> um, Cam sponsors, and so do we, but Cam does a lot more sponsorship with Eric Miller in that racing. That racing is, it has grown a hundred times in the last 10 years. That's how big it's become here in the States. Well, now, Robbie Gordon is a race car driver, an American race car driver who comes from a, a heritage of off-road racing. He's mm -hmm. won the 500, the 1,000 Bajas. Um, he's raced in oh, wow. he's raced in kart or IRO open wheel racing. Yeah. He's raced in NASCAR. Uh, and he's he has a series called the SS. T trucks, so stadium super trucks. And these trucks race on dirt and asphalt, but they have, they typically, I, I would say three fourths of the races are all on asphalt during a yeah. road race. And they set up jumps and they jump about 20 <gasps> feet and, and 150 feet on the asphalt. I saw that. That is the coolest thing ever so guess what that is i i'd love to get him on the show and talk guess about what? that yeah there's our willwood really yes because i mean i've seen i mean they, they like i said they, they all look like baja type and they almost jump on top of each other i mean that's happened a few times i've, yeah. I've seen some video clips on it that that is absolutely insane i need to go i mean that, that is like just a completely new level of racing that they've started. Yes. Um, and, and he also, you know, the, you know what a side by side or a UTV is? Yeah. So he has his own company that sells those as well. So Robbie's got a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. And, and a very good guy. Um, anyway, so again, it, it you can kind of see how we're in so many different forms of racing. Um, yes. And what we do is we take that information and we translate it over into other forms. So what's crazy is a lot of what I do for drift cars, I do for short course off-road racing. Serious. Because the, the braking is very similar. Braking similar, yeah. And um, the, the, the driving style, although one's on asphalt and one's on dirt, the driving type and style is still very similar. So mm -hmm. we take a lot of what we learn from either one of those markets and we we kind of bounce it off of each other. Bounce uh, it off. Exactly. Well, it, it, it means that, you, like I said, you, you, you can sit and keep thinking, oh, but, you know, and this type of racing we, we did that i wonder if that application can work on on this side so it does help cross cross pollinate if i want to put if i want to put that that Absolutely. way you know yeah the one of the rotors that we use for um drifting was actually designed for dirt circle track racing <laughs> so we designed it for dirt circle track but then our team of guys who handle the drifting realized that it's a perfect rotor for them so now we we utilize that rotor a lot in another market those profit centers like i told you about oh exactly exactly so, so that's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant 
So thank you so much for, for being on the show. I know we're running out of time on this side and I don't want to keep you. I know it's nice and early. You still have a whole day ahead of you. Um, mine's coming to an end. But thank you so much for being on the show. And I'll, I'll drop you a mail with some uh, a few other things. Um, but yeah, it, it, man, it, it's been entertaining and educational. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. you so much for having us on, Joe. Ah, no, absolute pleasure. And if all goes well, I'll probably see you at SEMA this year. Well, let me know. Let's when hope you... those borders open up. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, let, 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 <laughs> we can go do we we can go do the normal thing: drink beer, fist fights. You know, oh let's yeah, hang out. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll go ahead and follow so, up with some. Um, I'll follow up with some information. I, you, you put some things in my head that I think would help uh, spread the. The knowledge and and word about everything's automotive down in your neck of the woods. So I've got some ideas I'll share with you. That's it. Any any help you need from my side, if you want to get hold of anyone, form of racing or anything, I'm 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 there. I'm an email away. Uh, I'm more than happy to to, to help out. All right. All so, right. Thank you so much. Thank All you. right. Thanks. Cheers. Okay, bye. bye. Thank you.